welcome to the Southern Railway in 1944. Such was the massive load on the Southern Railway in the long lead up to and well beyond D-Day that many new sidings and marshalling facilities were laid down. Places such as Mitchell Dever on the line between Basingstoke and Southampton were vastly expanded and changed to 24-7 operation. However, the build-up of materials and machines still needed to be hidden from enemy attack. While the RAF had largely secured the skies, marauders were still a constant threat, and of course the dreaded flying bombs were also upon us. Therefore, within forests and on quiet branch lines, all the paraphernalia of war was hidden beneath the trees, within the new forest and other locations. This brings us to our little line and set of sidings. The viewer needs to understand the geography of the place to best understand the operations that are to follow. Furthest away, yet running parallel to the other lines, we have a reversible single line that had the happy coincidence of being a diversion away from the main lines and yet still being connected to them. Therefore, it was possible to divert special trains away from the more exposed main lines. This was often the case for D-Day freight trains. Often they took a most convoluted route. The next line closer to us was normally a link to a local station and small goods yard, but has been commandeered for the war effort and now serves as a reception road for D-Day freights in need of sorting and storage ready for the Corps when it inevitably comes. However, the local passenger service has been largely maintained, such as it is. Then we have a two-road yard, the big advantage being a great deal of tree cover. Admittedly, many trees have been felled to make way for all that must be unloaded, checked and made ready for dispatch when called for. Yet from the air, the sleepy little branch line would appear to be just that. A simple Nissen hut is used for the command post. All else is as it has been for decades. So dear viewer, watch now as all unfolds before you. And let this be my little tribute too, and way of marking the 75th anniversary of D-Day. by this lovely S15, a large consignment of tanks and War Department stores arrives for sorting. military have allocated two of their own locos for the job in the shape of a J94 and S100 class. The train must be split and shunted into the loading bay, then the tanks can be unloaded and placed in position ready for final checks. During a red warning, yards carried on working until the bombs dropped, but in total darkness at night.
In addition to the normal business of the railway, government trains accounted for. Personnel duty trains, 30,890. Personnel carried were 9,367,886. They ran 35,360 freight trains. Six million two hundred and sixty nine thousand one hundred and sixty on duty service personnel were carried on ordinary trains. While the shunting continues, diverted troop trains rush by. The CCS working is in the charge of Bullard Pacific Spitfire. Now one class saunters by with a van train for the docks. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yet yeah, more vehicles arrive from the local branch line. An 8F, then a D1 class hurry pass with freight workings. Schools class Eaton hurries past with yet another troop train. As Q1 C8 arrives with yet another military train for sorting and store. Let's see that again from another of our camera angles. Be ready, we've heard that two special troop trains from the London North Eastern region are due and rumoured to have been worked throughout with l &E r locomotives.
a Great Western Prairie loco draws away the empty war wells as a southern new one class heads a lengthy freight bound for the docks. With the tanks unloaded, the two WD locomotives head off together with a further freight working. A southern E4 arrives with coal and other commodities for the yard and onward travel, as schools class Repton dashes past to collect yet more troops, shortly followed by the arrival of the K class and yet another freight train. King Arthur class Excalibur passes by with another loaded troop train. Oh my, never have so many trains been seen on this line before. A train from the Midland region headed by a crab class dashes by, overtaking another Midland visitor on a freight working. Let's see that again from another angle. Things are definitely hotting up, D-Day can't be far off. A huge undertaking of the Southern Railway making ready for D-Day is well known. Its close cooperation with the military, and in particular the US Army, has been marked in history. In those dark days, the planned date for D-Day obviously couldn't be broadcast. However, on May the 19th, 1944, the General Manager made this communication. 
to all Southern Railway men and women, the hour of greatest effort and action is approaching. This gave the first clue that D-Day was very close. A Great Western Dean Goods Loco has arrived to help, very much part of both wars these locos. Oh, what's this? The moment is now. All tanks are urgently required for embarkation. This is London. London calling in the home, overseas and European services of the BBC and through United Nations Radio Mediterranean. And this is John Snag speaking. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, have just issued communique number one, and in a few seconds I will read it to you. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied Naval Forces supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. Following the S-15, an SR Q-Class arrives to pick up the other vehicles and is overtaken by a returning LNER empty train. As the Q backs its train into our yard, a Q-1 passes by with a long van train full of stores for the docks. Drum and K-10 passes by with a train of luggage vans and a few coaches, almost immediately passing an L1 on a return service of a similar kind.
The narrow gauge railways were important too. Finally, for our observations anyway, a Duke dog hauls the trains of munitions, its destination unknown, as with many trains at this time. Thank you.